This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. Black students in the South African ghetto of Soweto stage one of their largest and most violent anti-government demonstrations today. One youth was killed by police gunfire. Two children were trampled to death by a runaway horse-drawn wagon, and scores were injured. Robin Wright reports. Clouds of tear gas exploded throughout the troubled African township of Soweto today as police fought to break up mobs of protesting students. Police attacked taunting crowds with the crippling gas in a day of tense confrontations that moved suddenly from one trouble spot to another and then back again as students regrouped. The clashes grew rapidly to the danger point. Police switching from tear gas to guns when students switched from jeers to stone throwing refusing to disperse. Both sides were determined to make their point. The tension erupted when students took to the streets to protest the recent detention of their leaders and the double standard of education for blacks and whites in South Africa. The demonstrations began peacefully. Students carrying signs and singing in areas cordoned off by homemade roadblocks. Hundreds marched through several sections of the sprawling ghetto. Then the police arrived and anger grew into violence. Several vehicles were set on fire as youths took out their frustrations. Tens of thousands of African students made it clear today there will be no peace until their demands are met. Robin Wright for CBS News, Soweto. The man who ordered today's police response in Soweto and the detention of student leaders that sparked the demonstration is Jimmy Kruger, the most powerful man in South Africa and perhaps the free world. Doug Sefton has a report. Jimmy Kruger probably has more legal powers than any official of any country in the world, which is not a dictatorship. As Minister of Justice, it is he who personally appoints all of South Africa's 93 federal judges. And as Minister of Prisons, he is responsible for 250 penal institutions. As Minister of Police, he has command of 35,000 heavily armed men. Kruger contends that rubber bullets usually are not effective in troubled centers like Soweto. And rubber bullets only irritate. They do nothing else but irritate. The rifle itself loses its value because people think the rifle is going to spit a rubber bullet. So they laugh at the rifle. As I say, we only use a gun really to, to protect the man's life. And we have used birdshot. Upon his word, an individual suspected of any government activity can be held for 14 days without charge. Under the Terrorist Act, a person can be arrested in secret and held without access to a lawyer for as long as the minister considers necessary. Kruger argues that when American visitors, such as Vice President Mondale and United Nations Ambassador Young bring their campaign for human rights to South Africa, they only worsen racial tensions here. When as their Vice President, when the ambassadors of the United Nations tell them that the liberation is on the, uh, is, is, is on the go, when the United Nations pressurize everybody, what do you think the black man would say? He says, look, things are going to slow for me. Everybody's telling me I must go faster, now I want to agitate to go faster. If there is one thing Jimmy Kruger believes, it is that the white African is entitled to the comfortable lifestyle he enjoys. Kruger argues that most of the blacks here now migrated from other parts of the continent, coming to South Africa because this was where they could find work in the white man's industry. He and others like him fear that political concessions to blacks are the first steps to an eventual black takeover. And before they allow that to happen, they are prepared to fight. With regard to, to the racial policies, do, how much time do you think you have before? I don't know. I don't know how much time we have. I don't think there's going to be a blow-up unless a blow-up is caused from outside. Doug Sefton, CBS News, Johannesburg. Some powerful members of Congress have been fighting President Carter's decision to stop construction of the Clinch River, Tennessee breeder reactor. The latest development in that fight is a leaked report of a study which concluded that the breeder reactor project, quote, does not have a chance of success. Richard Roth reports. 
The report, labeled strictly private, was prepared by the New Jersey engineering firm Burns and Rowe, the company in charge of designing the Clinch River project. It raised dozens of questions about the planned nuclear facility, calling the location near Oak Ridge, Tennessee, one of the worst ever selected, and warning that politics, mismanagement, and design problems would make the project results extremely poor. The report predicted delays and cost overruns, but pointed out that the firm itself could stand to make a huge profit if the project went forward. In a written statement today, officials of Burns and Rowe said the 1973 report, which was never planned for public release, is now outdated. The statement said that problems cited in the early report have been corrected and that any questions raised have been fully and thoroughly resolved. The two documents are now being used as ammunition by opposing sides in the argument over what will become of Clinch River. President Carter has opposed the breeder reactor because it will produce or breed plutonium, a material used in making atomic weapons. He has called the technology too risky and has reportedly threatened to veto any measure that would continue the Clinch River project. Nevertheless, the House has earmarked $150 million to continue the plan. Science Committee Chairman Olin Teague of Texas saying opponents base their arguments on fear rather than reason. Action now rests with the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which put off a vote scheduled for today after the report was released. With the committee now reported evenly divided on the issue, no new vote has been scheduled. Up to now, some $226 million have been spent on Clinch River. $51 million have gone to the engineering firm that called it all a bad idea four years ago. Richard Roth, CBS News, Washington. The Labor Department has some encouraging news for the nation's job seekers. In a new monthly guide to available jobs, it said its list of openings has increased by 64 percent since the beginning of the year. And industries like construction, wood products, and recreation have more than doubled their call for workers. The Supreme Court ruled today that convicts have no legal right to form unions and states may outlaw such activity in prisons. The 7-2 decision said that a prisoner surrenders some of his constitutional rights when he goes behind bars. The case came from North Carolina where prison officials clamped down after some 2,000 inmates organized to improve working conditions. A sewer line in Akron, Ohio exploded early this morning, carving a 75-foot crater in the street, shattering windows and sending manhole covers high in the air. No one was injured. Fire officials think the blast was caused by naphtha leaked into the sewer. 3,000 gallons of the volatile liquid were reported dumped by vandals at a rubber company where workers are on strike. Since yesterday, the House has been amending the foreign aid bill to block loans to a number of countries, among them Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Uganda, Angola, and Mozambique. Speaker O'Neill, calling the amendments demagogic, says they're tying President Carter's hands. This was the legislative background of another of Mr. Carter's breakfast meetings with leaders from Capitol Hill. Ed Bradley reports. President Carter's meeting with 10 Democratic senators came on the heels of a stinging defeat in the House with the passage of an amendment which would prohibit international banks and lending institutions from using American money for aid to certain specified countries. Senator Alan Cranston said Mr. Carter has a better relationship with Congress than any other president, but still can't expect to win every battle. Of course there are setbacks. Congress gets its setbacks and the president gets his setbacks. And there cannot be total agreement. The system is not supposed to have total agreement. We had too much agreement between Congresses and presidents for a period of time. That's what led to the imperial presidency and the danger of one-man rule. We have to have differences. They're built in. But we can also work together, and we're seeking to do that. The Carter administration hopes the Senate will not agree to the aid restrictions. White House press spokesman Jody Powell said the one amendment that has passed could damage this country's ability to pursue our national interests by peaceful means. One White House official said the only countries which benefit are those competing with the United States for influence. Ed Bradley, CBS News, the White House. Tonight, the House gave its final approval to the foreign aid bill with its restrictions and sent the measure to the Senate. The Commerce Department has refused to grant an export license for the sale to the Soviet Union of a sophisticated computer. The department said the $13 million sale was blocked because of concern that the computer would be used for military purposes. The comparatively rare computers used by the United States to track missiles and plan space flights. The Soviets say they want it to forecast weather. 
The manufacturer, Control Data of Minneapolis, says it would take the Soviets years to convert the computer to military use, if they could, and the company may appeal the export ban. A long-running strike in North London has become the focal point of the deep and growing division in England between the far left and the right, and today the strike saw its most serious violence. John Lawrence reports. The trouble started as a bus carrying non-union workers arrived at the North London film processing plant and tried to get through the picket line. Reinforcements among the 300 police rushed in to hold back the crowd of over 1,000 pickets and their supporters, including mine workers from far away Yorkshire. More than 200 persons have been arrested in the past week of violence at the plant. The 10-month-old strike, Britain's longest industrial dispute, started when the factory manager fired a group of employees who were campaigning for union recognition. They wanted an increase in their basic pay from $1.25 an hour, a third of the national average. The arrests have included one member of parliament and a miners' leader, as public opinion has become increasingly polarized for and against the militant pickets. Dozens of persons were injured today, including this policeman who was hit in the head with a bottle. The dispute is no nearer a settlement, as it becomes a focal point for active labor and trade union intervention and confrontation with the police. John Lawrence, CBS News, London. The Soviet Union has raised the possibility that there may be no conference this fall to review the 1975 Helsinki Agreement, the one which includes guarantees of human rights. At the preparatory meeting in Belgrade today, the Soviets insisted that a preliminary review of the agreement ignore the human rights provisions. Otherwise, the Soviet delegate said, there will be no meeting. Divorce was legalized today in Brazil, the world's largest Roman Catholic country. A constitutional amendment was passed by the Brazilian Congress, despite strong opposition by the church, and will be signed into law by President Ernesto Geisel, a Lutheran. New drinking water purity standards for the nation's 40,000 public work systems go into effect tomorrow. The law requires that users be notified of water which does not meet the standards and what action, such as boiling, the user should take. Now that hot weather is upon us, more and more vacationers are taking to the roads, and our business correspondent Ray Brady tells us they're getting no relief at the gasoline pump. Read them and weep. Gasoline prices have been rising steadily with regular now selling at a national average of nearly 64 cents a gallon, up four cents in a year. But with the summer motoring season coming on, estimates are the cost of gasoline will go still higher. We anticipate that over this summer that motorists can expect another increase that might run anywhere from three to five cents per gallon. Prices are rising even though refineries may be heading for a near glut of gasoline. During the past freezing winter, refineries poured out fuel oil. But oil's complex. When you make fuel oil, you also turn out gasoline. So prices are increasing at a time when supplies are up, but so is demand. Some dealers, if they're in a resort area, for instance, they're going to get top dollar for their money right now. They're going to get 75 or 80 cents a gallon if the FDA rules permit it. Other people in a city like uh, Chicago or Los Angeles or New York where competition is a lot keener, where they're selling a nickel below ceiling right now, they may not be able to go up anymore this summer uh, because of uh, competitive pressures. Government regulations say prices can go up only when oil company costs go up. And among other things, refineries are importing more and more high-priced foreign oil. But if competition keeps a company from passing along those higher costs, the law says it can bank them and raise prices later on when it thinks the market will bear it. That banked credit now comes to one and a half billion dollars. People with new cars, the kind that use unleaded gasoline, may face an extra problem this summer. Not only will their fuel charges be up, they may run across stations that are out of unleaded gasoline. Because it has to be isolated with its own storage, and its own pipelines, and its own distribution system, uh, from time to time you'll have some logistical problems that could create a momentary station-by-station uh, temporary outage. Washington has long figured that if prices go up, the nation would get a bonus. Oil consumption would go down. Even with these higher prices, however, all signs are that Americans this summer will set a record for the amount of gasoline they burn up. Ray Brady, CBS News, New York. 
The whistleblower. It's Washington slang for a government employee who goes to the press or Congress and says there's something fishy in the department where he works. A whistleblower can be treated roughly, like Ernest Fitzgerald, who lost his Pentagon job when he disclosed cost overruns on the C-5A cargo plane. Bruce Morton takes a look at the plight of the whistleblower. Our experience is that the agencies do their best to, uh, uh, to demote, discourage, uh, fire uh, whistleblowers. We found that to be true in the case of Ernie Fitzgerald, who blew the whistle, and he was absolutely right on the C-5A. Fitzgerald himself agrees with Senator Proxmire. Blowing the whistle on the federal government is tough work. You really can't get away with it, even when you're right. By it, I mean committing truth, you know, which is a, a, a violation of the bureaucratic code of the hills. Admiral Rickover has said many times that uh, if you must sin, sin against God, not against the bureaucrats, because God may forgive you, but the bureaucracy never will. And Fitzgerald, famous critic of the C-5 transport, is a relatively lucky whistleblower. The Air Force rehired him, though in a less important job, not allowed to evaluate major weapons anymore. In his years of legal battling for that job, Fitzgerald has run up $400,000 worth of legal bills, which he can't pay. Dr. John Nestor of the Food and Drug Administration wasn't fired, just transferred a favorite tactic. He used to help decide whether new drugs were safe to market. He doesn't get to do that in his new job. Transferred, he says, because he refused to be soft on the drug industry. You've got to realize how many people they did this to. John Winkler, Dave Lidd, Carol Kennedy, Dr. Campbell, Bob Knox, myself. I mean, the pattern was all the same. It wasn't just John Nestor. Stanley Mazalewski has a PhD in preventive medicine. He was fired by the Public Health Service from his job at the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health because, he says, he went public over cancer-causing chemicals in industry. I was unemployed for uh, 17 months. Uh, I was smeared very bad, badly uh, professionally. Uh, I have a wife and four children to take care of, and uh, I ended up on a food stamp program, and uh, it was just a nightmare. Obviously, not all whistleblowers are legitimate. Some act out of personal motives, jealousy, office politics. But some are legitimate. The three we talk to all have outside evidence which supports their stories. Sheila Hershow of Federal Times, a newspaper for federal employees, says the problem is real. The way the government is set up now, nobody is punished for screwing up. Uh, the people who point to the people who screw up are punished. And presidential candidate Jimmy Carter agreed. On October 23rd in Alexandria, Virginia, Carter said, quote, I intend to seek strong legislation to protect our federal employees from harassment and dismissal if they find out and report waste or dishonesty by their superiors or others. The Fitzgerald case, where a dedicated civil servant was fired, must never be repeated. But Stanley Mazalewski has written President Carter three times. I've asked for a reinstatement because I went and tried to help the American people on this cancer issue. And there's been nothing on that. No word from the White House. No. The principal job can be done by the President of the United States. I think he has to act to make sure that uh, the people uh, who uh, respond to him recognize the importance of, uh, of uh, rewarding people who uh, find uh, wrongdoing in government. The President's appointee as Chairman of the Civil Service Commission, Alan Campbell, thinks legislation will be needed. He hopes to suggest some in the next two or three months. Meanwhile, whistleblowers continue to fare badly, and there is a moral in that for other government employees. Why point the finger at something that you think could be done better or more honestly uh, if uh, the last guy who did it is no longer working for your agency, and you know why? Congress may legislate to help the whistleblowers, but it hasn't yet. The president may act to help them, but he hasn't yet. In the meantime, the federal system has a word of advice for ambitious young bureaucrats. The word is hush. We have nothing. There's a program for amnesty for these fellows uh, from the Vietnamese War. There's a program for the Soviet dissidents, but there's nothing for oppressed American scientists who are trying to help the public and protect their interests. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Washington. About, <coughs> excuse me, about 50 of the whistleblowers are holding a conference in Washington this weekend to see what can be done to improve their lot. 
Ten days ago, three Girl Scouts camping near Locust Grove, Oklahoma, were murdered. Today, authorities say they are looking for a 33-year-old escaped convict named Jean Leroy Hart, whom they expect to charge with the crime. He was said to have been traced through wedding pictures found near the campsite. Averages were down slightly on the New York Stock Exchange today. Volume was 24,300,000 shares. The average price per share climbed seven cents on the New York Exchange, nine cents on the American. Five years ago today, a river swollen by rains from tropical storm Agnes inundated Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, killing five persons and wrecking much of the city. Sam Ford revisited the former coal town and he filed this report. Downtown Wilkes-Barre, five years ago, when the Susquehanna River topped the 38-foot-high dike system and reached the second floors of many buildings. In the entire area, 80,000 people were forced to evacuate. When they returned to their homes, they found destruction, debris, and mud. But today, city leaders reluctantly refer to the flood as a blessing in disguise. Without it, the city would never have gotten $125 million in federal and state disaster aid. Wilkes-Barre, through its redevelopment authority, is building a $2 million canopy system downtown to compete with enclosed suburban shopping malls. The city is also building offices, apartments, schools, parks, pools, sewers, and streets. People decided that something had to be done. We just couldn't rebuild it the same way. It had to be better. Uh, there was a necessity to uh, increase the spirit, if you will. Uh, we were not just going to return to the status quo. But others were happy with the status quo, particularly some small businessmen downtown who are now being forced to relocate or go out of business because the redevelopment authority is getting rid of those old buildings. I'm being driven out of it. And I can't afford to go in a place like uh, pay $1,400 a month rent for the same amount of space. I couldn't make it. And I'm happy being here the way it is. But I don't have any choice. Many homeowners are unhappy these days because five years after the flood, they find themselves tens of thousands of dollars in debt to the federal government, thanks to those 1% disaster loans. Since the flood, the federal government has canceled $5,000 of each loan. Now Wilkes-Barre residents have a petition campaign asking that the balance be canceled as well. Do you realize that there are over 30,000 loans and that the government owns this community, that people are in debt, their children will have these debts, that their homes are not really theirs and will not be theirs for so many years? Mickey Torbick agrees. She says she is $40,000 in debt for a house which fly-by-night contractors approved by the government did not fix properly. She says if she had it to do all over again, she wouldn't. If I had ever known, I would have just put a match to it. It was no way worth it. And so, five years after the flood, Wilkes-Barre may not be a completely happy city, but it is very much alive. Some say it is a better city than it was before the flood. Sam Ford, CBS News, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Agatha Christie arose from the pages of one of her books and solved a mystery. A British medical journal revealed today that a nurse who had just read a Christie mystery recognized similar poison symptoms in a baffling medical case and saved the life of a 19-month-old girl. And that's the way it is, Thursday, June 23, 1977. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. This has been the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. For the latest news early, watch the CBS Morning News with Hughes Rudd and Bruce Morton.